When I was growing up, I remember my grandparents, upon their retirement, took a cruise and train tour of the Alaskan coastline. My grandmother was very excited about this opportunity, overjoyed to see it. My grandfather, on the other hand, was just kind of along for the ride. He was excited, but didn't have a very high expectation. He knew it would be fun, he knew the food would be good, but he was not prepared for how amazing that journey and tour was going to be. He expected it to be good, but it was far better than he could have ever imagined. We're continuing our study here in these midweek devotions through the book of Ephesians. We're in Ephesians chapter 2, and against the bleak backdrop of hopelessness, that we see at the beginning of chapter 2, how we are dead in our trespasses and sins, we see the Apostle Paul introduces the work of God in a powerful way. Last week we saw the grand statement, but God, who is rich in mercy, because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ By grace, you have been saved. He continues unpacking this now as we look today at verses 6 and 7 of chapter 2, saying this, And He raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. The main point I want you to see here today is the glory and goal of being made alive in Christ. The glory and goal of being made alive in Christ. In Christ, you are raised up and you are seated with Him in heavenly places. This echoes what we saw last week as we mentioned the fact that we are made alive in Christ. We've been raised up in Him. The power of God in the resurrection of Jesus Christ has brought brought death to life. Those who were dead in their trespasses and sins are being brought to life in Jesus Christ. To be dead in sins means spiritually you are incapable of any good or righteousness before God. It means your every thought, your every action is filled with sin and wickedness before a holy God. Now, while we are free moral agents, in the sense that we do make real decisions as human beings with real consequences, we must realize that our free moral agency is always in accordance with our nature. We are born into sin. Every person, save Jesus, is born into sin after the sin of our first parents, Adam and Eve, in the garden. Our sin nature directs all our choices. Our free agency is informed by our nature. In our sins, we are spiritually dead because our nature is bound in sin. Thus, all of our actions are sinful before a holy God. Yet, God in Christ has raised you up. In this spiritual resurrection, you are giving a new nature. Now freed from the bondage of sin and death, you are free as a moral agent to choose to follow God, to obey His rule and His law. While still on this earth, free agency in the struggle between the new life we have in Christ and the the struggle of the flesh, that's the language that Paul uses in Romans, this conflict within the Christian of choosing right versus choosing wrong is is made available because we are made spiritually alive yet still in this fallen world, in fallen and broken bodies. Yet being raised up, resurrected with Christ, we are called to be continually transformed, to be renewed from the inside out, through reading the Word, through the study of the Scriptures, to be transformed, to be made new, to live according to that resurrection that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. All of this is possible because Christ has raised you up. Now, for the Christian, we have to realize there are two resurrections. 
The first is a spiritual resurrection. In salvation, you are made alive, spiritually raised to life. The, the old word that was used by the church a hundred or more years ago is the idea of quickened, brought to life spiritually. Those who are dead in their trespasses and sins have now been made alive in Christ Jesus. And the second resurrection is a physical resurrection. And that will occur when Jesus returns. In that great day, the dead in Christ will rise. All those who have trusted in Christ will be made alive again, made new again. These broken and dead bodies that are not made to last will be made again in glory, patterned after His eternal glorified body. And that resurrection will free us fully and finally from the ravages of sin and death in the whole of our lives. God has acted to bring you to life in Christ Jesus. He has raised you up, but not just that. He has seated you with Jesus in the heavenly places. Did you catch that in verse 6? And He raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places. The language here is past tense, but speaking of a future glory. The blessings we observed in chapter 1, if you remember chapter 1, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. This is where He has seated us and is secured because it is accomplished through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. When God ordains something to be, it's as sure as done. For Him to know something is for it to be. Think about this with me. The Bible teaches that God is all-knowing. If God is all-knowing... Therefore, if something were to exist that God does not know, He would not be all-knowing. And so if we follow the logic there, for something to exist means that God knows it. God has ordained. He knows that all those who are in Christ will be seated with Him in the heavenly places. The certainty of this is so far beyond question that it's stated even in the past tense, even while our experience of it is our future hope. It would be significant if God were to simply rescue you from death and give you eternal life. He has raised you up and He has seated you with Him in the heavenly places. Your rescuer has brought you from death to life and that life is an abundant eternal life with Him in the glories of His presence. The with Him here in verse 6 is also significant. It is with Him that we are raised up. It is with Him that we are seated in the heavenly places. This means that your position before God is tied directly to Jesus's. This is amazing. Because Jesus' security before the Father is, the, is what indicates your security before God. Jesus is resurrected forever alive again. Your resurrection spiritually and one day even physically is that secure. Jesus rules and reigns at the right hand of the Father and your place seated in glory with Him is that secure as well. God has made us alive in Jesus Christ and has guaranteed your eternity with Him in Christ Jesus Hear me clear in this. If you are not a Christian, these promises are not for you. Yet for all who will call on Him, for all who will turn from their sins and ask God for His saving grace, God has promised that He will save them. And every one of these promises, without exception, will be yours. Christian, realize your faith in Christ Jesus secures this glorious blessing.
But why has God done this? Look at verse 7. So that, that's a purpose statement, so that in the coming ages He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Back in chapter 1, verse 19, part of Paul's prayer is that we would have eyes to see the immeasurable greatness of His power toward us who believe. And now, in verse 7, we see that in the age to come, God is going to display the immeasurable riches of His grace toward us who believe. God is going to spend eternity showing you in new and fresh ways every moment of eternity the greatness of His love for you. Imagine being wowed by the amazing grace of God every moment of eternity. Heaven is not going to be boring. Sadly, so many people have this this wrong idea that eternity with God is going to be some long, boring, solemn church service, sitting in hard wooden pews and not allowed to say anything. No. Eternity with God is going to be a real glorified, perfected life. In eternity with God, we are going to be amazed at every moment by new and glorious realities of the riches of His grace. I don't know if He's going to put up a video screen and walk through the life of every person He has rescued and redeemed and saved, showing the greatness of His grace and love at every moment throughout all of history. Perhaps it'll be like a personal conversation where He'll be dialoguing with you and all the hosts of heaven about the greatness of His grace, showing you in detail of how He has acted on your behalf. Or perhaps it'll be like a brilliant diamond turning. And with each small turn, A new facet of the diamond displays the radiant brilliance and colors of His grace. I don't know what it's going to be, but whatever it is, it's going to be awesome. Why is God doing this? So that you will marvel at Him for all eternity. My grandfather came back raving about how wonderful his experience touring Alaska was, far beyond anything that he had ever imagined or expected to take place. Christian, in Christ, what God has done and has in store for you is far beyond what you could ever fully imagine. In fact, it's going to take eternity for you to even begin to grasp the magnitude of the greatness and riches of His grace toward you. Marvel today at the glory and goal of being made alive in Christ Jesus.